Hi, am I audible at the back? All good? My God, come on, we can expect a little bit more noise. We, we're, we, I'm sure we all had a great lunch. Okay, super. So welcome everyone uh, to this panel. And, and uh, like our host said, we have an extremely esteemed panel here. Um, and I can't wait to pick their brains on the topic of content marketing um, and the impact that it can have in the long run on brand engagement uh, and on brand communications. Uh, I'm Kanika, I represent uh, Tabula, a company that is known for its content recommendation engine. Um, and in fact, I must, uh, I must share that one of the questions I get asked the most across panel discussions and otherwise is that uh, how do you really ensure ROI of content marketing in the long run and how do you really effectively distribute uh, content? And uh, to that, I'd like to say, I think a very good solution lies with what Tabula does, uh, because Tabula makes sure that your uh, content is contextually served. So it is served at the right time, at the right place to the relevant audience, which actually increases the ROI, the biggest question on the table. And then it distributes it you know, through um, premium publishers, through uh, a variety of partners, making sure that you get the scale that you're looking for. So I think really the solution lies in ensuring uh, that we are able to find right partners for our content marketing strategy. And today with this esteemed panel, we will definitely dive into what are the strategies that they are using and uh, how they are really looking at driving more ROI, more engagement and more impact through the power of content marketing. Uh, so that's our agenda today. Very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, would you want to take a few seconds to introduce yourself and then we can go right to the panel and maybe in your introduction you can tell us briefly why you are so passionate about content marketing. Uh, hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ankur Malhotra. I represent Bristol India. I'm heading marketing for them. Uh, in the past, I've worked with brands like Unilever as well as with Abbott and Cadbury. Uh, now, Primarily just answering on this particular question, which is relevant to the topic that we are touching upon over here. I think it's a term which has been coined in the recent past or so when we are talking about content marketing, so to say. But we all as marketers know that how important it is in terms of communication, communicating to the right audience in a right manner altogether. We all have been, you know, earning our bread and butter out of it. That's one. But the, another important aspect is if I have to just look at, there are multiple categories that I have, you know, made some changes. I moved into automobile, currently I'm working with tires, I have in the past sold ice creams. Everywhere, what, mess, what matters is resonate. What exactly is the message, what the brand wants to give, what is the vision and the mission, what exactly is something that the consumers would clearly understand, basis which they will take their decision. So it's a medium through which historically I've worked into brands and marketing to be able to influence the choices and you know helping the consumers make the right choice. This is primarily the reason why exactly I feel so excited about content marketing. Wonderful. Hi, I'm Nitin. Uh, I head marketing for Aqua Insurance. Uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short. I think why do I feel passionate? I think number one, there is no choice but to feel passionate about this in the ecosystem that we are in right now. Uh, if I don't do it, I'll lose my job, <laughs> right? Uh, but yeah, I think I think uh, that apart, um, I think at least uh, I've spent most of my career in building online D2C brands, right? Right from Make My Trip to Ola and now with Echo, right? And um, I think the power that uh, content marketing keeps unleashing and it's also gone through its own stages of change that we've seen in terms of um, helping specifically challenger brands become um, more amenable, more trustworthy to consumers and to get them to move across either mind measures or uh, business measures. I think that power has been fantastic and, and I've seen them in, in a lot of areas up front and I think that's sort of also what keeps the fuel burning inside that yeah, you do need to chase something like this. Hi guys, everyone seems to be in a post-lunch slumber so thank you for still giving us a full house here. 
Uh, I'm Divya, I'm a brand and culture strategist. I currently lead the marketing mandate at Nourish You. Uh, I'm not sure if you all are familiar with the brand, but it's India's first superfoods brand. We're in the FMCG space. Um, I like to call myself the wildcard hire of this company because all my expertise prior to this was in fashion, beauty, lifestyle. Um, and the reason I actually I was excited about working with Narishu and, and I feel the other way around is because we're hoping to be movers and shakers in this space by leveraging the power of content. Uh, the reason I feel particularly passionate about it is because you get to tell a brand story in, in a multitude of ways through content marketing and, and that's what excites me the most about it. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Sujala, Head Marketing for Platinum Guild India. And of course, uh, as a body, we're quite different uh, because we are a guild. And uh, the single-minded agenda is to drive demand for platinum in this geography. Uh, having said that, I mean, I can't think of a tool that's more relevant to us than content, really. Um, our consumption culture in this country, no surprises, is driven by gold. And uh, therefore, it's a very complex task. It's a very audacious one as well. And I think what really comes to the rescue is content. And there are many forms uh, with many objectives. But I think if used correctly, uh, content can shape culture, can change consumer behavior, can change perception. And I think uh, that's our game and that's what gets us excited. I don't think in marketing there's a more exciting job than creating a new category. And uh, that's the way we look at it. And we look at that uh, through the lens of content. So, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, I think it's clear that everyone here is extremely committed and passionate about content marketing. On that note, uh, Divya, let me start with you. Uh, how has your experience been, um, you know, towards using content to really create a strong identity for brands? And how do you make sure that it is distinctive uh, when the online world now is so cluttered? Absolutely. So I think content is crucial in helping build a brand personality, right? Every brand is like a person. It has a way that it, it, it looks, it has a particular aesthetic, it has a way that it sounds. And every piece of content that you create and put out has to be reflective of that and ultimately contributes to that brand identity. I think my favorite example to give, and I think we might all agree with this, is Nike. Um, and, and the brilliant way that they've done storytelling, any digital ad they put out, any communication, any event that they're even hosting, will always be driven by this inspirational, motivational, just do it um, uh, kind of communication, right? And that over time, those pieces of content is what's worked towards making Nike what it is today and given it a very distinct identity. Um, you have Glossier, which is a beauty brand which disrupted the industry and, and built a billion dollar plus brand off the back of purely content marketing. Uh, you have a bunch of exciting new startup brands in India that are also leveraging content marketing using a very editorial tone of voice uh, to, to build community online. And I think that's something that, you know, I'd love to discuss as well is how content can help build community. So they're not just communicating with their consumers from the perspective of, hey, this is our product, why don't you buy it? But uh, talking about other aspects of life that that product would fit within, right? So if you're selling a beauty product, you might want to talk about wellness inside and out, right? So you might you might talk about fitness, you might talk about yoga, you might talk about um, you know beauty inside and out as compared to just selling a product. So that again is something that can be perpetuated, I think, through content. No, that's that's great, and I, and Nike is a fabulous example. I think many people in the room will relate to that. But just to build on it, uh, Ankur, we'd love to hear from you on what do you think are specific strategies that can be used to engage the audiences and then over time build customer loyalty through content marketing? I think uh, everything boils down to what exactly, you know, when we are talking about strategy or content strategy. Uh, in different categories I've seen, everything boils down to what exactly is the insight. Now, we might just take it lightly in terms of for every brand, you know, understanding of the TG in itself is good. but. On the entire path to purchase, how that particular decision making process is getting influenced? Which exactly are the right influencers? Is it the family? Is it the situation? Or is it something what exactly as a content they would have absorbed some time back? Now, if I have to just pick up an example in my recent category that I am working, tire, tire is one of the least interesting or engaging category for anybody over here. If anybody is over here giving across a challenge to me saying that tire is something very interesting for me, I, you know, I would have a surprise for myself. 
So is there anybody who would just raise his hand saying that, you know, beyond automobile, tire is an interesting category for me? Nothing. Would you have gone across on any, con you know, social media platform and searched for a tire brand, except, you know, barring the last 45 days or 60 days when the World Cup was happening and some of our leading competitors were sponsors? Not, not at all. It's a grudge purchase. I think that's the fact. If you are in a situation where your vehicle has broken down, it's a flat tire, you would look at, you know, whichever is the best alternative available for you. But at this stage, if I am able to make you remind of Bristone delivering on to best of quality tire in terms of durability, you will be reminded of it, but you will again go across and check into the outlet from a price perspective. Now, that's what exactly is the entire part to purchase. So I can't sit down in my office and decide upon a strategy saying that humor is something which is working well for other brands, I will also do. What is humor going to do for my brand and category? The relevance aspect is something which would be missing. So I think the strategy is pretty simple. Uh, look at what exactly is relevant for that particular target group whom you are serving. And whatever is the overall part to purchase, if you are able to bring across your brand as top in the funnel for them to be reminded of when they are in that need. That's what exactly we look at. Super. Um, and would you like to build on that, Nitin? I, we were just chatting and you had some very interesting perspectives to share. Yeah, sure. So I think, uh, see, I think more from a strategy perspective, um, at least in my past experiences, we've seen enough and more value that the right content marketing strategies have delivered across different stages of the funnel, right? For example, you consider um, awareness leading to a higher top of funnel for your brand, right? And content has a role to play there, right? You talk about more mid funnel in the, in the path to purchase, while I think it's different for say tire, retail and outlet, it's, ex it's a little bit different for online and D2C brands, right? Uh, like a simple example from, um, my current experience with ACO, right? I think uh, we are into uh, extremely trust heavy category, right? Like specifically as we move from car insurance to health insurance, it's, it's a decision you take right now to trust somebody who will be there for you say up to 20 years down the line, right? And moving a certain metrics more from a mid funnel perspective that, okay, you know, advertising is giving you enough air cover that people are actually coming and checking you out, right? right? But how do you get them to actually consider your product once they've landed, which advertising alone has not been able to solve for, right? And I think that's where I think we leveraged a lot of content marketing, not only um, external channels, but also owned channels. So we had a, uh, like it's still ongoing, like a hugely successful on the app, uh, content marketing play that we've recently introduced. We got um, uh, Madhvan uh, to basically come on board to represent voice of customer, nice. right? Because what we felt was that like maybe people will not trust the brand saying it, but if you have a like an intelligent persona like like Madhvan actually coming in and representing the voice of the customer. Uh, asking the same questions that we've seen a lot of other very nice uh, yeah. right and and uh, strategic investment behind that placing it in the right stages of the funnel etc that has worked wonder for us and it's sort of complemented all the advertising and you know like the all the glamorous work that you see out there I think you know it needs to be complemented with a lot of this hardworking content marketing strategy as well, which, which has a role of its own. No, and I'm so glad you mentioned that, right? Like, because there is, of course, a glamour, glamorous side to content, which is all about the storytelling, which is all about, you know, getting the right influencers, stars, maybe even authentic consumers to tell your story. But then there is the hard side of it, which is the, like you said, the you, content that works hard, which in other words means that content that drives return on investment. So Nitin, anything that you would like to share, uh, you know, how do you make your content deliver better return on investment? Okay, I think that's you've given me a very tough question to ask. So I'll try and dodge it a little bit. And, and so, no, so I think, uh, uh, I think we, we were having like a part of this chat inside also. I think it's um, very important to uh, 
have the right expectation setting in terms of what a certain content marketing strategy can deliver. What is the KPI that it will deliver on? I think uh, in today's world where patience is extremely less and fragile commodity, uh, I think the pressure on content marketing to immediately translate into sales is very high. And I think a lot of marketeers also fall under the trap that I can only justify it if, if I'm able to sell my product through it. Uh, I think what's, and I think that's the worst thing that you can do from like, not just like a content marketing, but any strategy perspective. If you say that you're going to chase something, which is not really the objective of that piece of content or that strategy to deliver. So I think a uh, right expectation setting internally with your stakeholders is extremely important. I think as marketers more than selling outside, we have to sell it inside, yeah. right? That, that, okay. Is this like, for example, you know, the, the Madhvan piece that I was just uh, talking about, right? And digital gives us the perspective of making it a lot more measurable in terms of, okay, was this piece of content able to influence X percentage of users more to move from stage A to stage B in the purchase journey. If it was able to do that, then it has done its job, right? And, and I think you assign the right KPIs to it. I think your job will be a lot easier from that perspective. I think last bit, I think content marketing as a tool. And I think like the topic also says, right? The role it plays in long lasting brand building. I think you've defined the lens in some ways in the topic as well. Uh, and I think uh, like one thing that I like to keep at the back of my mind and I keep uh, telling my team also sales overnight, but brand over time, right? And if you're investing in content marketing, I think mostly it's towards building attributes that can help you more from a long lasting. So it can be identity, it can be tonality, you know, it can be trust, it can be education, whatever you want to build for. Right? Fair enough. And I think, uh, Sujala, if, if we may build on that, um, clearly there is a, there's a very real struggle on how do you convince your internal stakeholders to continue to invest in content marketing, especially when you're faced with the pressure of, like you said, sales overnight. Uh, but you know in your heart as a marketer, the right thing to do is to also simultaneously build the brand over time. Um, and of course, there are, there are external stakeholders, which could be your franchise partners, it could be your customers, your final consumers, with whom, of course, you have to do content marketing in such a way that it is either emotionally resonating with them or it is uh, fulfilling a gap in their lives and providing some value. So how do you balance uh, internal and external stakeholder management, uh, you know, with the lens of content marketing? Um, so I think primarily, you know, in content marketing, I think once you determine what is the expected value exchange, uh, sure you have content to put out, but uh, in, t in the sense a consumer is looking at either information or entertainment or at least access. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is, that's one part of it. I think if you build right with reach and relevance, uh, then ROI sort of follows and that's, that again, a function of the category, a function of the objective that you're looking at. So you will always have a mix of objectives. And I think it's very important to bring clarity in terms of what is this pillar of content trying to solve? What objective is it trying to meet? Because in categories where the, where the task is as complex as new adoptions or change in perception, they don't happen overnight. And then looking at it from the lens of traditional ROI, will like never work. So, yes. uh, you know, I think at the risk of sounding boring, consistency and a slightly long tunnel point of view is important. Wonderful, I think there is tremendous consensus within this panel that content is a long-term game and we have to find ways to be patient with it, uh, whether it is with our strategy with our customers or whether it is with uh, setting the right expectations internally. So, you know, just to, just to build on that, Divya, any uh, success story, any specific example that you would like to share with us where you feel that you managed to strike the balance and get some wins for your brand? I'm, I'm going to stick. Yes, sure. Anybody else would like to, you know, share any success story or examples? Yeah. 
I think I'll uh, just add one more bit in terms of, you know, responding back to the last question. Uh, there's a simple methodology between me and my team, which we have adopted in our organization, just on the lighter side. There are two, you know, flips, which we can just see in terms of how any particular idea is supposed to be sold. One, when we look at from the, you know, the consumer lens, it's completely the positive tonality, which we want in terms of all our content development. But the second aspect is in terms of the fear of missing out or, you know, doing something, what not doing something, what the other brands are doing. That's the approach which we adopt internally to sell to the management. So when we go to sales or when we go to management, we primarily talk about what exactly we'll be missing out on. So suddenly there are many approvals which are signed off immediately. Now what we do is with those approvals, we create content which is much more relevant for the consumer. So that's how exactly we approach it internally. That's just a trick of the trade what we adopt with our team. Now Please to respond note, back. Guys, that's a good one. FOMO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, at times we have to pick and choose the, I don't have a solution right now, which somebody would say that, you know, forcefully incorporate AI, let's go and create something with Gen AI. I don't have those solutions. I'll wait for that. Now, when we are talking about any particular communication, which has really uh, been sort of, uh, you know, working well for us during COVID, when the entire world was under lockdown, we created one particular content with the agency under those, you know, very, very critical and challenging circumstances for our truck and bus radial tires. Now, the moment we look at that, it's a category which was, you know, uh, completely at a standstill. The supply chains were completely closed. There were few truck drivers who were actually carrying the product, you know, the healthcare product, the food and nutrition from one place to another. We just looked at that particular aspect of when we are looking at for a, such a low involving category, can emotion play a role? Can the circumstance play a role? Can we, you know, highlight what exactly is the struggle that these truck drivers are taking to run the supply chain? So that's one particular content which we created under immensely challenging circumstances. Uh, that content got created over the course of 15, 20 days altogether. That did wonders for us. Now, one is the, you know, the operational or the executional challenge, but second was altogether in terms of whether we want to create a branded content and leverage on the current emotion. So you have to have a fine balance in terms of it doesn't come across that the brand is trying to just leverage, but there is a contribution what the brand is doing. So the entire CSR initiative, which we do is something which was incorporated very well in that particular content, which we created. The whole idea over here is don't do things for the sake of doing it. Have a very well thought through, you know, integration of your brand and the story, what you want to communicate. That is one. Second aspect is clearly I have seen over the course of various brands and categories that I've worked on. It's a very simple thing which we keep on hearing, but young brand managers ignore. Consistency is very, very important for the brand thought and personality to be established. Consistency of messaging and content development is very critical. Super. Um, and Divya, just to, uh, you know, build on that, like he's speaking about consistency. I just want to add to that, um, that it's hard to be consistent when everything around you is changing so fast and it is so rapid. So in an era of, uh, you know, constant change in consumer behavior, how do you make sure that you can adapt and stay relevant and stay consistent? I think the key to staying relevant is to understanding the zeitgeist. Um, and for us, especially at Narishu, that's incredibly important because we're in the alternative milk space, we're in, uh, you know, the plant-based food category, and that requires a huge cultural shift, especially in a country like India, where milk is such a daily part of everyone's routine and life. And a lot of people aren't even aware that they're lactose intolerant, you know, so, so that's something that we're actively working towards um, building content to do. But a few ways to stay relevant if you're a brand is, I would say, definitely speak to your consumer. Consumer insights are key. Understand who they are as people, what they like, what platforms they spend their time on, what music they listen to. If they were to go to a restaurant, what kind of restaurant that would be that'll help you build a, you know, a consumer persona really well. The second way to also do that is to study content. So look at the way that they're interacting with other content pieces. What are the search terms that are, you know, are trending at the moment? Um, uh, you know, what are your customer responses or comments that are being left behind on your social or digital channels? 
Uh, and finally, the most important piece is to actually study the cultural moment you're in. Uh, and there's a ton of people actually doing this, right? You have foresight analysts, you have cultural strategists um, that actually look at very qualitative insights about the time that we're in. Uh, so there's this firm I know called Trapidol, which actually works on creating culture reports purely about the music industry. Um, you have Yuva here in India, which is actually led by, um, you know, a former professor of mine, Nikhil Taneja, and they do fantastic research on youth culture. Uh, you know, so a lot of my experience is also towards building brands for millennials and Gen Z. And, and when you have reports like that, or you work with organizations like that, and they do tie up with Spotify, YouTube, um, Meta, you know, Pepsi, so on and so forth, to, to, to do these, um, uh, you know, cultural analysis reports uh, of, of what the youth of the country is leaning towards. I think that that really helps in making sure that you're very, very relevant. No, that's, that's a lovely point. I think uh, what we're trying to say here is that there's a very close connection between content marketing and culture. Uh, and sometimes content marketing doesn't just take inspiration from culture, but it's the other way around as well. Sometimes you can pit, you know, put out a piece of communication, a piece of content that is so powerful and so moving that it can create impact on culture. So it's a two-way street. Uh, content takes inspiration from culture and other way around as well. So your thoughts on that? I think it's such a beautiful point. We should hear from everyone on uh, what they feel about it. No, I think um, uh, two points. I think firstly, uh, the fundamentals of marketing still apply to the content marketing game, right? For example, all the things that she spoke about, which is consumer insight, being close to your consumer, etc. Like what applied up, say 15, 20 years back from an FMCG setup still applies to content marketing game. And I think that's something that we should continue doing. Uh, I think the other piece where at least we've seen a lot of inspiration coming from, I think while uh, culture and context is extremely important, I think at times we end up underestimating the power of our own channels right and we look for like a lot of stuff outside as well where at times a lot of uh, you know what are your consumers really into what do they want you to make is actually resting right on your own content so for example like you have a presence on on social media you have uh, people actually uh, talking to you on call center people leaving a lot of comments, reviews, etc. App Store and otherwise, I think specifically for us, I think um, mining a lot of uh, insights or behavior traits that consumers have left behind on our own social media channels and handles has played a very important role in terms of some ways preempting that, okay, if this is what people are really how they even answer to your comments, right? The form factors that they use to answer to your your comments is also like an interesting Absolutely. point to yeah. Yeah. leverage. And like there could be like a ton of information right under your nose, which we might be underestimating. No, that's a great point as well. And uh, let's build on it further. I think you spoke about using different kinds of channels. So Jala would just love to hear from you, your point of view on different channels, different platforms that can be used both to learn from and also to distribute the content. Yeah, so uh, just to start out with, I think what we just touched upon in terms of culture was a very important point and a very relevant one, uh, because uh, you know that uh, that itself is a vehicle of dissemination. Very often, you know, uh, as a brand, uh, you can either touch upon something that is a cultural transformation moment, and for example, uh, you know, like Dove did it. Um, uh, like in, in more recent times where, uh, for example, if you look at their campaign on no filters, which borrowed from culture, but then did one up on culture and said, you know, you know, you know, in a segment that's obsessed with selfies, here's the reverse selfie, for example. Or uh, there are times when you use uh, culture very effectively to be a multiplier. And, you know, maybe uh, here I can spend a moment or two talking about one of our brands and that would be Men of Platinum. And for Men of Platinum, for example, obviously it is targeted at the male TG and uh, cricket is obviously a big affinity with the male TG. Um, and what we've effectively done is really use, uh, you know, the reverence for the game 
uh, use an upcoming icon. I mean, at the moment, the face of the brand is Surya Kumar Yadav. And, uh, you know, create content. And it's a series, it's a content IP, it's a minute with Men of Platinum. And it really gives the audience, uh, you know, a look into uh, the man behind the jersey. And uh, it's pretty much uh, the multiplier of cricket with, in combination with an icon has a multiplier of its own uh, in some ways. And that's, uh, that's, that's one, one take on it. Uh, the other thing is also, I mean, again, for us at Platinum, uh, we are talking to a far younger audience. And uh, affinity for our offering lies with a younger audience. And therefore, you know, it's time to kind of just, uh, you know, take what you always thought worked and kind of reassess it from time to time because you need to move where they are moving. For example, uh, you know, uh, TV is losing audiences and, uh, you know, they are on OTT maybe. And, and therefore, for us, it made perfect sense to rest content and park it on a Disney Hotstar because that's where they are, for example. So, yeah, I think those kind of uh, choices come at play. Super. And any other, you know, strategies you want to share with us for distribution of content? Anything that you have observed uh, works better or uh, can help you deliver longer, better ROI in the long run? So I think there is a plethora of, I mean, hyper -frag fragmentation is very, very, very real. Uh, and there are a lot of emerging platforms. Uh, there's audio streaming, of course, uh, music and otherwise. There's video streaming. There's live streaming. Uh, you know, and all of it has its own metric attached to it. For example, if you're doing live streaming, you're not looking at high reach numbers there, but you're looking at converting the few that are plugged in and giving them an immersive experience. Uh, so yeah, the, I mean, the plethora keeps expanding. It's what you choose bases your objective that really, uh, you know, puts it in, in the right framework. Amazing. So I think we've touched upon a lot of themes. We've touched upon the connection between content and culture, about having a balance between strategies that are short term to mid term to long term. Um, and also, of course, you know, different distribution models um, and how do you drive relevance so that your content is being distributed at the right place at the right time. What I'd like to do now is touch upon something really special. Uh, so while content can be powerful, when it is juxtapositioned with the right context, it can be, it can be absolutely, um, I would say, uh, fantastic and fabulous. Uh, because suddenly a consumer is reading content which is not just relevant to it, to him or her, but it has also been served to him at the right time, at the right moment. Uh, and in my experience, when content marketing is mixed with the right context, uh, it creates magic. It's almost like the context is the secret sauce. Um, in fact, I was at another panel discussion of this kind in Delhi. And one of the things that came up was that if content is the king, then context is the kingdom. Uh, and I was so proud at that moment because I felt like the Bula is a true enabler. It enables the king to rule the kingdom well because it just helps you to distribute uh, content uh, with the right context. So I just want to understand that if, you know, moment marketing, context marketing, timing of various events and your content and how do you modify and leverage all of these opportunities is something that you consciously plan for and really how much of it can you plan and how much do you have to adapt in real time. For example, we see a lot of brands uh, quickly hook on when there is a big moment that happens in a sporting tournament or you know when there is something big happening let's say in a music festival or anything like that. You see a lot of brands like Zomato, Swiggy, etc. quickly jump onto that bandwagon and uh, really enthrall consumers with some very, very witty content marketing. Uh, so would just love to hear from all of you, in fact, uh, where do you think the importance of context lies um, and something that is maybe special to you, uh, you know, in terms of moment-related moment, moment -related marketing? I think uh, very rightly said so, but, you know, context matters significantly. Uh, Creating, now if I have to just go back to the example which I cited some time back, creating a film about a truck driver, if it, if it would have not been that particular situation, it would have not resonated. Because there are different pieces which are coming together, otherwise for a boring category, it's another film what exactly the brand has force fitted or they are just trying to you know establish a connect. Similarly, if I'm just looking at 
you know, there's a lot we have been talking over the course of last one decade in terms of personalization. So there are some pilots which I've worked in my Oswell brands or in the current, uh, you know, the role that I take. Earlier, uh, I was working for a brand called as Pediasure with Abbott and clearly over there, the message through the CRM team has to reach out to mothers who are clearly worried about in terms of the health and nutrition and growth of their kid. At what stage the message is given matters significantly. So we never went about in terms of shooting out SMSs or WhatsApp messages. It was very much clearly, you know, as a part of our approach that when the mom is waiting in the chamber of the doctor, that's the time when exactly this message has to be given. Because the level of uh, resonation, the level of what exactly is the top of mind concern for the mom, how exactly she takes that particular message when she is given an opportunity to get into the doctor's chamber and articulate the right question within those two to three minutes that she is getting with the doctor matters significantly. Similarly, if I have to just look at sort of a data marketing initiative which we are currently running, we are sitting in a conference. If you are getting WhatsApp messages about Bristol offering 20%, who's going to jump out and get the tire change? Doesn't matter. My point over here is whatever is the solution that you have, you know, it needs to deliver at the right space and in the situation, what exactly is the most, uh, you know, relevant for your brand and consumers. Uh, if I have to just look at, there are various segments which we address to, and there is an emerging segment of auto enthusiasts. Now, auto enthusiasts typically would be talking about, you know, the engine quality, the aerodynamics, the seats, the other functions and the features of an automobile. But there's a lot of discussion which is happening on platforms like Quora. This was something which was completely ignored in the past. A simple exercise what we have done is, that's the platform where people are going to look at the most content which they can, you know, a trustworthy content which they can believe they can execute. As a brand, we have just done one exercise pick up the top 20 questions around the category, answer it back to them in terms of, you know, the language, what they easily understand as consumer, not necessarily bringing across the details of the compound of the tire, which I have. That has worked really wonders for us because as a thought leader in the category, then we are able to move these consumers from Quora to our website to ask much more relevant questions about Bristol, what we can discuss. So context, platform, situation, I think it all matters significantly. Yes, I, I just noticed that our time's up. So maybe we can do final thoughts from, uh, from all of you. Uh, and in that, you can touch upon the relevance of context if you, if you would like. So Nitin, uh, maybe we start with you now in terms of the final thoughts. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I, think, I think time's up. So I'll keep it short. I think just closing the loop on moment because in today's age, I think... Yeah. Um, just one simple advice, don't chase everything. Like it's not important to have something going out for every moment. So I think what's helped us as a brand and maybe, you know, if there are brand managers here, they can take you also that some stuff you can plan and we pick and choose our battles that if it's a planned event, okay, these are two, three things that matter to our TG, we will be prepared in advance in terms of what's the template that we are going to follow. Uh, anything that's unplanned, I think stay true to the tonality that you've built. I think a consistency in that tonality will only get amplified and do it. So, so pick your battles. Don't just be in a rat race that, you know, because XYZ brand is jumping on the trend. I also have to jump on the trend. Great point. I think very simply put, marketing money follows time spent. So as long as you study your consumer journey, you know exactly what part of their journey you want to target them. And um, very tiny example, if I want to speak to an urban consumer in a city like, say, Bombay or Bangalore, where, they have, where they're stuck during their commute time, should I reach them through a podcast? Should I reach them through that little TV at the back of your Ola's, right? Because that's where they're sitting idle and they will most likely register my brand. So... Um, in terms of finishing thoughts, I think thank you so much for having me on the panel. It's really been a pleasure. There's been a lot to learn from everyone here. Um, and I love to say content is king and we're just foot soldiers. So thank you. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, uh, context is queen, I thought. 
<laughs> but <laughs> that also but works. Uh, yeah well uh, i mean yeah i couldn't agree more because it's all about timing uh, you catch me on a bad day and you'll get a very different response uh, that works for our audiences as well and i think uh, there are many facets to it right from audience insights to you know what is the situation and the analysis of the situation what is the geo what is the location what is the cultural context of that tg at the time all of that is part of context really and also what uh, a bit about what you said you know where it's possible to do some kind of predictive analysis you should because that gives you uh, you know that gives you a bit more clarity on what is likely to work and what can't work uh, and just, yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more on the moment marketing uh, bandwagon bit because I think, you know, multiple uh, marketing teams across are like severely under pressure every time there's a moment to come up and say something super cool and super quirky that can be like, you know, shared. Uh, and I think you should do that only if there's something relevant to say or if you're going to say something refreshingly different because by morning, everyone has multiple forwards of what happened in the game last night. So if you don't have anything amazing to say, it's better not to. I think that those were some great insights out there, some really lovely nuggets to walk away from. Uh, don't do anything till it is relevant and you really believe in it. Uh, don't do something just for the sake of it because others are doing it. Uh, and if you do do something, uh, try to make it more culturally relevant. Uh, try to have a sense of balance between short term and long term. And most importantly, try to get it contextually right uh, so that you can uh, really make use of uh, moment marketing. So I hope that those insights were useful to everyone. Uh, and a big thank you to our esteemed panel. We got through a lot of questions, uh, so almost it was like a rapid fire in a very short period of time. So I hope you all enjoyed it and a big thank you to Exchange for Media for organizing this. And uh, long live content marketing. Uh, let content be king and let context be queen. And please uh, continue to work in this field with tremendous passion because that's what tells, the passion is what actually translates to great stories and great content. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much.